A special address from Trash Future Rationality correspondent Brendan O'Neill. This week, the chattering classes of this once great nation have yet again been all of a flutter about what, you ask? The ever-increasing war on Christmas? The relentless drive to ruin smoking? No, dear reader. The Tahini Trotskyites of Essex Road, N1, are furious about former Prime Minister Tony Blair being given a knighthood in the New Year's Honours list. These Camembert communists would have you believe that the traditional knighthood afforded to former prime ministers shouldn't be given to Blair simply because he is a white man, and also due to the controversies surrounding his time in office. But if we were to strip the knighthoods of every white male politician we disagree with, who would be next? Sir Winston Churchill? Sir Oswald Mosley? The list goes on. Indeed, these petty four posadists of Zone 2 seem hell-bent on effectively making it illegal to be a politician. Are we to assume that in their twisted worldview, a UK Prime Minister would never be allowed to invade Iraq again? We may debate the merits of the 2003 war and its outcomes all we like, but just because there weren't WMDs in Iraq doesn't mean there couldn't have been. Was Tony, suppo- was Tony Blair supposed to possess the powers of clairvoyance? By setting this precedent, What do we expect the response of a British government to be to the emergence of, say, God forbid, a Nazi Iraq? Where would their woke (laughs) compass point them then? (laughs) It is unfortunate for Tony Blair, however, that he is far from innocent. These Halloumi hosherists and Ancho Flake anarchists (laughs) didn't emerge in a vacuum. Indeed, they were forged in the flames of Blair's own woke agenda. In the 70s and 80s, the left were defined by the horny-handed miners and factory workers of the trade unions, but since 1997, the only horny-handed leftist is to be found in his polycule. (laughs) Blair's dismantling of Britain's manufacturing apparatus and propagandising of the youth via the hippie drivel they were read at Sure Start centres from leftist diatribes such as Pip Goes Strawberry Picking and Billy Blue Hat have ironically created the conditions for his own demise. The Sancerre Sandinistas he forged (laughs) will not stop until our nation's honours fit their perverse diversity requirements. I do not know, dear reader, how many honours will, in years to come, be given out by the Queen with her hair dyed blue to assorted vegans, anarchists and (laughs) so-called academics, but I fear the number may be close to (laughs) 1,984. I don't know how you keep coming up with these um, <laughs> alliterations. <laughs> I, I don't know how he does it. I, I don't know. Uh, hello, 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 hello. It is the first episode of TF this year, and mm. we've decided to make it one of some Imports. monumentality. Yes. We've, we've yes. decided to yeah. do a good episode as a joke. Yeah. That's right. We're uh, only doing it as a bit, so I don't think we're going to be doing this regularly. <laughs> no, uh, I, I hope you all had a good Christmas and New Year's, but we are back. And don't write in. <laughs> we are, yes, uh, if you had a good Christmas and New Year's, uh, share that information with the people close to you, not yeah, us. Keep that shit um, to yourself. Uh, no, it's, uh, it, it's all of us. It is Riley, Alice, Nate, Hussein, and Milo, and we are going to be talking about something that I think, something that, I, that I've been thinking about for a while. Uh, ever since uh, I start, I gave the um, the 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 London Mound a permanent uh, place of residence ah, in my yes. brain, which is uh, great monumental projects done by uh, British political mm. projects that feel like they have to do and say something written in the physical world, but where they sort of don't have anything to do or say, and so it mm. just ends up being strange. Mm. So, with all that in mind. I want to open with a quote from, uh, from one Anthony Blair. The eyes of the world will be on Greenwich as the clocks strike midnight on December 31st, 1999. Where once there was derelict land, people will see the most st- spectacular celebration anywhere in the world to mark the millennium. I urge people to support this project because I believe it's good for Britain. It's a display of confidence in the creativity and talents of our people and a chance to, for all to shape our future and begin the 21st century the sense of purpose, hope, and unity. It will be a time for the nation to come together to be excited, entertained, moved, and uplifted. Visitors from all over the world will have the time of their lives. We are all going to come together thanks to a dome. (laughs) 
a mm. big dome. <laughs> Everyone in Britain loves dome. Dome got us coming together as a nation. <laughs> Today, he concludes, mm. Britain need not settle for second best. And uh, no, we did not settle for second best with the dome. I don't think we had to uh, worry about that. If only, if only we were anywhere near second <laughs> Today, best. Today, Britain does not have to risk achieving second best. That's right. <laughs> In this dome, we have a creation that I believe will truly be a beacon to the world. That's right. It's the Millennium Dome two-part spectacular to open up mm. 2022. Yeah. Um, so, it's the dome. It's the dome. You remember the Millennium mm. Dome? Oh, I remember this? the Millennium I, Dome. I've only ever heard yeah. like vague references to it, but I never really appreciated that it was ever a thing anyone cared about. Oh. It, well, the Millennium Dome is only where Han Solo lives. <laughs> so, jot that down. We are probably going to talk about this some more uh, later on, but in the kind of like southeast suburbs, um, the Millennium Dome was the biggest thing. Um, and I remember that very, very significantly. It was like, yeah, it was the biggest thing in terms of like, it was geographically the biggest thing that like existed around there. But yeah, you, you have Hussein and I as your Southeast London correspondents to tell you of there course. was fuck all else going on yeah. in, in Bromley during like the millennium. Before year. that, you only had Chislehurst Caves and the Glades. That's right. Hey, I, I have so mm. many, I have so many stories about Chislehurst Caves. However, I think every primary school in that area did one mm. field trip at least to the Millennium Dome. And so, for those of you who don't know, the Millennium Dome, uh, especially Americans, Millennium Dome is, uh, now it's the O2 Center, it's a big concert venue, but it was where Britain had its gigantic celebration of the Millennium. It's the- Yeah, and, and in form, crucially, it's a big circus yes. tent. So yeah. if you want to know where it is, look up the O2 Arena in Greenwich and you'll see that. And it, or but, watch The World Is Not Enough, the James correct. Bond film. <laughs> yeah, you can see Pierce Brosnan so, skid down the side so of it. So it's in the news now, right? Because uh, new sort of li- new labor archival documents were released. And Tony Blair said, quote, I'm worried about the lack of the wow factor in the plans for the Millennium Dome, uh, which he claimed would be a triumph of confidence over cynicism, boldness over blandness, and excellence over mediocrity. This will become uh, an unusual statement as we get in. Yeah, because he sees the actual plans, which are for a big silver tent, and goes, oh, these look shit, actually. (laughs) So, uh, Charlie Falconer, who is in charge of the dome, the minister for the dome, as he was called. um, Yeah, that's right. Said, we need at least ten wows. Oh, (laughs) yeah. yeah. Because labor centers have been partridge forever. It was, well, that's... Gentlemen... That's quite Hancock. We cannot allow a wow gap Mm. to to embed. (sighs) Yeah. You know, what's funny is I was just thinking about the big gimmicky thing in the early 80s was they were going to use like really weird proprietary technology to make a modern Domesday book. And this is like the late 90s version of that. Instead of a new Domesday book, they're just building a dome Mm -hmm. and uh, they're getting just as excited. And I feel like it's historical impact is about as insignificant as that this is a very funny side note but they they made this massive huge collection of stuff like of contemporary britain in the early 80s but it all used proprietary tech and now no one can read it like it's not you can't use computers to read it anymore because like yeah so i do wonder deep down if britain just has this recursive need to involve a dome in its life and uh (laughs) this was just one manifestation does have a recursive need to try to justify its own existence and project to its people and everyone else around the world. Yeah, a recursive need for yeah, don't. That's right. Yeah. So Falconer, Falconer wrote that we need at least 10 wows. All of mm. our exhibitions are too samey and worthy. Uh, Blair annotated the note, this is indeed very worrying. <laughs> <laughs> isn't the sex pa- isn't the sex palace in Brighton also uh, a dome? It is a sorts? pavilion, technically. It has yeah. domes. Yeah, yeah, it, but it has multiple domes rather than so. Being once again, a that's dome. the that's that recursive yeah. pattern in and British history. A dome when emerges. The fourth, Time is a flat. Yeah, George the Fourth built himself a special <laughs> fat boy treat mosque. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <And> right. <laughs> uh, the dome was a controversial scheme, but Falconer wrote to Blair, we have a dome, and now we must all work to make it a success. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen, you, you, you go to Millennium with the dome that you have, not mm. the dome you wish you <laughs> had. Look, the dome's been built. The only question is, what are we filling the dome with? Okay, let's just be clear on that. <laughs> so, and then the, the re- newly released um, memos go on to say, that Al- Alistair Campbell, who was a member of the Dome's board, said that the Millennium Project should be completely refashioned from the ground up. The site extended, for example, to accommodate a hospital, businesses, charities, private residences, and the whole thing should be named the Princess Diana Center. 
Awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> These cool. We used to build things in this country. Brackets the Princess Diana Memorial City. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Princess Diana Necropolis. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, yeah. They should make it into a massive mausoleum for Princess so, Diana. Separately, <laughs> there, should if- be a, there should be a special track where you can drunk drive a Mercedes in the Millennium Dome. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a better activity than any yeah. of the ones they came up with. But I think it goes to one of the things that sort of just is indicated with some of these some of these people like like, like Campbell and Faulkner and, and Blair and John Prescott separately is and, and Mandelson plays huge in this. Is they all sort of people whose Very buttery brains dumb. were broken by marketing and who are unable to extricate themselves from trying to get the answers they want out of a focus mm. group. And you'll see this come up again and again and again and again. Well, luckily, this didn't lead to any uh, institutional problems in the labor no, party. Never, never, never. Uh, finally, before we go off this, the, the la- this bit, um, one of uh, Blair's aides did say that Diana's death could give us a semi-plausible excuse to bail out of doing the dome. <laughs> wow. <laughs> awesome. A, a nation in its sorrow cancels its dome. Well, so- I, I mean, if you, want, if you want a quick vignette of just how like, much Princess Diana is like a fucking landmark in the minds of the British public, uh, recently my mother and I dug out some old camcorder videos that I managed to get working. There's a video of me on the on the beach in Devon somewhere in 1997, and my mom's going like, "That holiday when we went there, that must have been that must have been." She's like, "That's the day Princess Diana died. That's what that is." <laughs> well, like, so <laughs> this family vignette. Here's a, a selection of the the dramatist personae, some of the people that we're going to be talking about. There's John Major and Michael Heseltine, who actually came up with the project. Uh, Blair Brown. Uh, Brown hated it. All, all of the like Baroque inspiration you would expect from John Major. Mm. Well, that's exact. We'll get into sort of what John Major wanted it to be. Uh, but it's it, Blair, Blair who who loved it because it was his thesis statement about what New Labour would be. Brown who hated it because he thought it was like extravagant and unnecessary. Mandelson, the first minister of the Dome, um, who is just uh, revealing himself to just be a fucking moron throughout this entire process. <laughs> Good old Mandelson, Again, a guy who like. It, it's it, throughout this whole process. He's again behaving like someone who wants to imitate the thick of it before it was made. It was very interesting. Uh, John Prescott, who nearly had his career derailed by some of the um, uh, uh, after effects. Charlie Falconer, the minister of the dome after Mandelson, now the chairman of a, a landlord organization. Uh, Jenny Page, the head of the New Millennium Development Corp and former head of English Heritage. Um, and then her replacement, Pierre Yves Gibault. Uh, Gerbeau, rather, the head of the... Oh, yeah. I remember P.Y. Gerbeau. Yeah, he was absolutely like a, a figure of some note in British public consciousness, which is an insane thing to think so about in, in hindsight. He was the former head of French ice hockey and then an executive at Euro Disney um, right. and was made uh, the head of the company when Page was sacked for not French selling... ice hockey. Correct. They Sorry, I just, we just let that yeah. one go, but... No, he was always seen <laughs> zipping around the dome on like a little, like a little scooter. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I remember this. He was just absolutely a, a prime guy. Had podcasts existed at the time, mm. we would have lasered it. He would have been our guy on the. He dome. was like mm. he was like a Matt Hancockish figure. Awesome. Um, absolutely. Richard Rogers, the architect of the building itself and recent corpse. Roger. Uh, Philip Anschutz and Richard Borm, <laughs> who were two <laughs> politically connected billionaires. Tessa Jowell, the Secretary of State for for DCMS, who was going oh, yeah. to. Uh, basically try to legalize gambling. Uh, Detective mm. Sar- Detective Sergeant Shatford, who investigated a sting diamond heist. <laughs> BC shuffles were. <laughs> and then the entire yeah. cast of Blue Peter, who put a bunch of 1999 shit in a time capsule that accidentally got dug up in 2017 instead of 2100. Wait, in fact, was that fucking Richard What's-His-Face? Um, <laughs> Baker, Richard, Richard Bacon. Bacon. Yeah, absolutely. So A, a, a man, man who fired from Blue Peter from the doing 90s. cocaine. Yeah. 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 He stashed a little of that in the time capsule. Yeah, but that, that was cool. So, uh, I want to ask Milo Hussein and Alice for your anecdotes, your memories of of Dome. My anecdotes, yes. my memories of Dome. Yes. Uh, the thing I remember about the Dome mm. is going is going to it with my parents mm. uh, because like they thought it would be some sort of historic event. Seeing some Cirque du Soleil bullshit <laughs> with like uh, g- mm. guys on wires from the roof of the Dome, and the only other thing that I remember is the bodies. Yes. Of the dome. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, which was the pre- the premise of this was that you would walk around inside a big human body and look at how it worked. Mm. Yeah, 
So basically, like the disgusting magic school bus. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. Or, or like the movie Inner Space. Yeah. Everyone gets to be uh, a Quaid for a day in the dome. Yeah, this is. Yeah, it's, it, it, as Huey Long said, every man a Quaid. Yeah, this is. It was a vision of Britain that accepted and embraced Vor, something that sadly <laughs> the modern Labour Party refuses to both acknowledge and to uh, and to endorse. Uh, and I think that's, I think I think that's really it sad. It actually was Vor, it was, I think yeah. it was one way, yeah, you would, and you <laughs> entered via the mouth, and you exited via the anus. Yeah, yeah you entered, dude. so I remember, like, I remember um, I went on a school trip there, like, everyone in South East London, uh, or, like, mm. in the suburbs of South East London at the time, um, and a bunch of us were really scared to, like, go inside the mouth, because it was just, like, I know you, it kind of reminded me a bit of, like, you know Attack on Titan? Um, and like the monster, like the kind of like big mon. I I've only watched a few episodes, yeah, but, a little bit. Yeah, but the idea that like they kind of they have this these big gaping mouths that don't necessarily consume you, but you kind of end up entering it. Um, that was kind of what that the human yeah, body and everything was like made mm. out of this like weird foam mm. sort of effect. So it was like spongy but not wet. One thing I <laughs> one thing I remember, which I thought was like a fever dream, but actually turns out to be real. Was that there was like a giant naked boy in the dorm mm. in the dome? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, so I I thought I thought it was fake, but um I think it might be real. Um, <laughs> giant the, naked the ones boy. Who, the ones who walk away from dome. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm gonna like post a picture into the chat just Alice in case like you remember it. It's like the se- it's like the second picture. Okay. Uh, well, 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 Hussein's doing that. Uh, why is there a giant boy? There's a giant ah, boy. Oh, there's that... a giant naked boy in the dome. Why? Well, I mean, he's wearing he's wearing shorts. He's wearing underwear, like tan but, yes, shorts. There's a gigantic. Yeah. He's wearing chino basically shorts. Basically naked is what he's boy. Wearing. Hmm. <laughs> uh, this is, oh yeah, yeah. The body thing. Yeah, that the body thing was also my abiding memory of it. Um, and I distinctly remember that in the rectum part of the body, there was a new labor spad pointing at the prostate and telling everyone that that was the male G spot. <laughs> and, uh, and that one day we would all get pegged too. That's why. That's why. That's why. That's why the, that's why the dome got shot down yep. because yeah. there were too many harsh truths being spoken. That and yeah. ge- entering the body zone from the rectum, genuinely and back in my, and out. My really only quickly. other memories of the Millennium Dome are that they were playing Madonna everywhere, and that I got a pencil sharpener. <laughs> that's. I I, I, ha- I have another memory of the okay. dome, which is that they screened. A special mm. spin-off time traveling Blackadder episode in it. So I, I in what, the dome. what this is, right, is it is a it is a showcase of of new labor trying to make something that was both quintessentially British, but that could appeal to sort of any person they could possibly imagine, while making their thesis statement about like the uplifting of the spirit of man, essentially. Um so sure. It was also just a weird tent that no one had any idea how to fill, and so what what mm. was like placed in it was just a selection of people's weird ideas. What I was going to say was that like it remarkably felt really empty even at the time. So like, and I rem- I remember like yeah. feeling this when we had to kind of sit down on the floor for like this weird Cirque du Soleil thing. Um, which like none of us understood what was going on. Some of the performers like were also really bad, and they like I remember there was one that fell off like one of the trapezes or whatever. Um, <laughs> and like it fell off like fairly gracefully. I mean, cons- all all things considered, but it was just like, oh, that was a weird. I don't think that should have happened. But what I was going to say, in addition to that, is if you go to the O2 now, um, and the O2 is like nearish my house, so like I go there every so often. It's also really, really em- like it feels really, really empty, right? There's like so much kind of just like open space that isn't really doing very much. Um, so like. To me, it's kind of this like, oh, you've just built this structure in which, like, regardless of what you do with it, it's always just going to like feel kind of like it's going to feel like a strip, like a weird strip mall. Yeah, t- t- Tony Blair, like, how can we fill this giant dome? And a guy who looks a bit sinister is like, well, I have this massive statue of a child wearing <laughs> chino shorts. <laughs> look upon, look upon my works, you mighty. Well, one last thing, which is that, like, I remember what really struck me about it as a child was that they spent years building this thing, and then it was only open for like a few months. We had 120 days of so dome. <laughs> <laughs> what well, it, it just looks. I feel like we should share that link, that very early you know, year 2000 internet link that Hussein found, because the photos really illustrate how it looks like if they decided to get discount Jeff Koons art in like mm. a, t- a temporary airport terminal that was just built for some reason mm. and called a dome. Like it looks very impermanent and shoddy. Mm-hmm. That's the best way I could describe it. it. It's just, it's so weird that this was meant to be some kind of epical installation. Like, 
just kind of looks like mm. shit. And I mean, all right, I'm hard on Britain. I always talk about how basically everything looks like shit here. But like this, this is a particularly advanced level of shittiness. So here's how it all came around, right? Um, the the in East Greenwich Peninsula uh, had this gas works on it that operated for about a century from 1889 to 1895. And then the contaminated land was like toxic sludge and you couldn't really go on it. Um yeah. Well, that was all like industrial, like Docklands yeah. sort yeah. of area then, right? And so, uh, John Major's uh, uh, John Major's government has this idea uh, to sort of to extend some older programs and say we're going to make a development corporation here. We're going to clean up the sludge, and we're going to have something that will usher in the 21st century. Drain the sludge, <laughs> like, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's like an embarrassment to have London, which is as we've mentioned before, the only city in the country. Just have one third of it be yeah. like, oh, that's the goop yeah. zone. Do not it's, enter it's fine this. for other cities to have a goop zone, but yeah. we can't let like, the Grinch zone. lives. <laughs> so, um, and so, a committee of MPs then approves the plans uh, with the ambition specifically to recreate the 1951 and 1851 uh, exhibitions. Uh, that we're gonna let, let in their time sort of showed sort of, that showed Britain that here's what it is that we're doing right now I introducing these new modes of living whether it was the 1851 introducing the kind of here are the plunders of our empire and this the splendors of our conquest or in in 1951 being like um, we have won and we have we have been proven victorious in the Second World War. Here are the wonders of our state-owned industries. Please don't become communists. Here is asbestos flooring. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, the and so the Millennium Exhibition is supposed to echo these things. It's supposed to be very big, but no one really knows why they're doing it. They just feel like they should because there's a big round number. Also, this was like this was a purely British mania. Like no one else did shit for the Millennium. Uh, that as far as or I recall, like this like it wasn't some international phenomenon like it was just a sort of calendar oddity. Yeah. Well, it's it wasn't even the millennium in Australia until about 2005 that's how little they cared I think it's because there's this the, the British state always feels like it needs to put on exhibitions of what it's doing but then you have the perfect postmodern stuff I'll, I'll get into it so uh, Secretary of State Peter Brook said of the the plans for this whole Millennium Fund because it wasn't just the dome; it was also the London Eye and and, and other projects. Oh yes, yeah, which is which is so perfectly New Labour. Like we have given London a circus tent and a Ferris wheel. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and you can look but at the tent just from a the Ferris wheel. Systematically, yeah, applying my clown makeup. So I see the Millennium Fund," said Secretary of State Peter Brook at the time, mm. uh, as largely promoting projects with which um, lie beyond the scope of an individual organization. Yeah, uh, precedents, flams, things of that nature. <laughs> precedents, including the Great <laughs> Exhibition of 1851, which is a remarkable celebration of the greatness of the arts, manufacture, industry, and commerce, and then the Festival of, of um, and then the Festival of Britain, um, which was a tonic to the nation after the Second World War. They left their architectural legacies. Was it though? It was intended to be, uh, such as the uh. Crystal Palace or the Royal Festival Hall. The fund now offers the scope for making real improvements to the face of the UK. So. Uh, for example, like getting a little more into it, right? The, the great fest, the Festival of Britain, uh, was you know remembered especially by people at the time as something of a success, uh, and specifically the success of Herbert Morrison, who was the grandfather of Peter Mandelson and the head of the scheme in the Attlee government, a so, man with a very buttery lineage. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're just like in into like uh, a sort of ancestral flimflam. Peter Mandelson is just such a central plank of every big two parter episode we ever do because he just he just has his spindly little fingers in every single pie. <laughs> so displays go up all over the country in, in mm. 1951. It was sort of centered on Waterloo, but there was lots of things there. And it displayed actual new technology, stuff like there were lots of stereoscopic films. Asbestos. That's right. It was asbestos condoms, asbestos cocaine. <laughs> yeah, this robot can smoke a pipe. And a lot of the films were, were sponsored by state-owned industries, such as the Petroleum Films Bureau sponsoring Air Parade and Forward Century. Um, Petroleum yeah. Films Bureau. Creating a shitload of YouTube zone Correct. content. Yeah, it's us. British Pathé, basically, um, yeah. Uh, at the time of the planning, the director general of the festival said, Always before, large-scale national exhibitions had been organized in trade sections. Space was for, uh, sold to firms to display their own wares in their own way. We were going to dispense with all that. We were going to tell a consecutive story, not industry by industry, but the story of the British people. There was no space to let. The theme of the exhibition was developed with sequences which correspond to certain activities of British life. For example, exploration and discovery, industry, transport, rural life, home, and sport. I've just had a horrible realization. Yes. 
what the Millennium Dome was intended to be to the liberal centrist brain is what the 2012 Olympic opening ceremony actually did. 100%. Which was, you know, our island story or whatever. But instead of doing that, because Danny Boyle hadn't been invented yet, what they got was um, a circus tent filled with a, a child, a giant. So what child. happened was, like, with um, is is that like the um in in this case it was their first crack at doing the 2012 opening ceremony. They kind of thought they could do it themselves. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, imagine if the uh, the 2012 Olympics has opened with a bunch of people wheeling out an enormous naked child. And that would have been better. It's just occurred to me, in fact, that essentially what New Labour did with the Millennium Dome is prove their entire thesis statement, which is that the government shouldn't be allowed to do anything. <laughs> like, they're hmm. basically like, oh, imagine if a private company had done this, it'd probably be better, eh? <laughs> well, we'll get to the parole of private companies. So... One of the main planners of the Dome Project was a man called uh, Michael Grade, who is now the Lord Grade of Yarmouth, um, and he's basically been... The Lord Grade of Yarnum, yeah, gotcha. He's basically been like a TV impresario sort of the whole time. Uh, he was on the planning committee. Uh, he said, and oddly enough, this is from an article... So I did basically just lots of archival research for this. This is from an article in 2003 written by, of all people, Nick Cohen. Huh. Um, hmm. Friend of the show. Yeah. That's like... There's like three people in yeah. Britain. Yeah, the thing, and two of them are Peter Mandelson, yeah. and the other one's Nick Cohen. <laughs> in 1851 and 1951, the great and the good created the wonderful tableaus, and then lifted the curtain and allowed the great unwashed to have a peep at how great their leaders were. So this is Michael Gray talking about his ambitions, and the quoted by Michael by Nick Cohen. This show is different. Here is the people themselves who are the focus. It says, think about your own life. The people are in charge. They can make their own mistakes. They're not being told what to do, what to be, or how to act. What the Dome says to them is, here you are, folks. Here are your choices. You decide. The cool. Dome speaks. Choose your own adventure, Dome. Well, it's a, it's, it is a perfect postmodern um, uh, exhibition of the greatness of Britain, which is, mm, is whatever it is. It's, it's a liminal maybe, space. It's kind of like, yeah. Optimistically, well, you're yeah. on your own. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And the thing is, right? It says this is it, it's it, it doesn't do to be sort of to be you know nostalgic. Um, for but like this is the perfect. This is like before um the sort of spinners of uh uh, uh you know the, the 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 economic system we live under now, right? This is before they figured out how to sell it well. And so this lo the logic of the postmodern, which is, well, there isn't anything right. We don't know anything. You don't know anything. So everything is just what everyone feels. And it's all just vibes, um, which really comes through in the exhibitions. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to check out the boy? Yeah. You want to walk? You want to walk through a, a, a how about the faith zone where uh, we say mm, many believe in God? And that's sort of just it. Young right? Ozymandias, the big boy. Yeah. So. This is, but it's, it, but this is specifically the repudiation of modernity. This idea that there are a great project of some kind to be undertaken. It's not to say again, like the imperial project was not a, a good or laudatory project. Um, yeah, no, it was like instead of imposing this top-down vision on you, we're going to offer you no vision. Precisely. Uh, so the civil service said, and and this is what this is supposed to be, right? This. There's this, this weird, amorphous, no vision, this idea, well, we'll build a giant structure, and I assume we can just fill it with sort of things that will appeal to people because we have our focus groups. Um, and that's like, this almost shows like how focus groups are like the knowledge gathering tool of modernity, of post-modernity, which is just, well, anything anyone says is right, and we just want to reflect them back at themselves. Being the one Grandpa yeah. Simpson type guy on the new Labour Facebook group going, there should be a giant boy! <laughs> <laughs> That's what the people want, a huge boy so, in chino shorts. The, the, the civil service said, the overall purpose of all millennium activity is several fold. Millennium activity. It says, it is to re-energize the nation mm. uh, and to change perceptions, specifically to raise the self-esteem of the individual to engender... Did they get this off a bottle of links? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> I was going in the opposite direction. This is the new Labour human instrumentality project. <laughs> uh, to engender a sense of pride in the wider community and to enhance the world's view of the nation itself. So it's also a bit of a foreign policy project, right? Which is, we are going to be the standard bearers of this thing that turned mm. out to be total horse shit. Awesome. Yeah, everybody else is going to be like, check them out. They've got a dome. They've mm. got a dome. A it's got dome. a boy. Uh, it's got the. <laughs> it's got several McDonald's's. Um, 
and uh and, and yeah did it actually uh yeah mcdonald's was a huge sponsor of the whole thing and so oh, cool mcdonald's um they actually one of the shows in the millennium dome was something called in our town where people from various towns up and down the country uh like high like high school kids made like little videos about like like what it was like living in their town and then it was all presented by mcdonald's are they just like interviewing oh. the the new labor people about this? So so you're telling me for the for the millennium, what you've done is you've built a big Ferris wheel, yeah, and you've built a massive circus tent, yeah, and all the food is being provided by who? Don't make me say it. <laughs> <laughs> Who's providing all the food? He's a big clown. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all right. This is but the thing is right. What what they're trying to do with just. The expression of feeling with the expression of some kind of a with the, the with almost the um trying to empower people by just saying, oh, you're free to do and think whatever you want here in the dome um, is. <laughs> but you can never leave. <laughs> right. This you know what I'm getting at. Right. This this idea that, oh, the the dome is there to reflect you back at you. It's this kind of 1990s sort of vision of, of what empowerment yeah, slogans are. Yeah, it's it's one of the only places where you can really directly look at yourself through uh, your anal cavity, uh, and realize that you Absolutely. and realize that you are a free and autonomous individual that doesn't but doesn't need the state. Yeah, mm. you can investigate your own root chakra, and this is like before mm. New Labour authoritarianism really mm. kicked mm. in, right after nine eleven. And that's the thing that makes it so interesting to me is that like before they became punished New Labour, mm. right? This was their vision. This was what they wanted to offer people. I mean, say what you will, but you couldn't do nine eleven in the Millennium Dome. Yeah, go no, right through it. Yeah. <laughs> it bounce off us. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, we, we buried the entire left of the Labour Party in pursuit of uh, a d giant yeah. anus. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Getting an asbo for gooning the ass of the giant body. <laughs> <laughs> so, by 96, right, this was still a Tory project. I mean, when all these announcements were made, it was a Labour project. But by 96, uh, uh, ministers have been unable to raise private capital. Uh, and so... They needed to get sponsorship from the from the lottery fund, which was again created by John Major, like which was sort of forwarded by John Major to be this thing that would fund all these wonderful cultural activities. Ninety seven, of course, uh, ownership of the project is taken over by New Labour, the architects of what passed for the future at the time. So Jenny Page was drafted mm -hmm. in uh, to say, "Don't worry, you can still stay on as the head of the Millennium Experience. Uh, you have a budget of three quarters of a billion uh, pounds, and that's a combination of." National lottery money, ticket revenue, where a ticket for a family of three was fifty-seven pounds. Um, that was a lot of money yeah. then, too. Yeah, uh, and we expected twelve million visitors. Uh, for context, Euro Disney, after several relaunches, got ten million visitors a year, and that's after several years and being Disney with like actual rides, as opposed to just a great big butt that you could walk into. Yeah, and also being run by the French ice skating yeah. champion. Um. Yeah. And also, about a, a big tranche of the money was to come through corporate sponsorship. And I've sort of hinted at how some of that cashed out. So, uh, Blair is sort of uh, cagey about taking it on, but he relents. He, he gives a speech in uh, 1998. This is on the 24th of February. In the Millennium Experience, I want people to pause and reflect on this moment about the possibilities ahead of us and the values that guide us are, as a society. It will be an event to lift our horizons and a catalyst to imagine our futures. As we approach the millennium, can we boast that we have the richness of talent in this country that is unparalleled? We, the finest of artists, authors, architects, musicians, designers, animators, software makers, and scientists. So why not None put of it them working on this project. <laughs> <laughs> so why not, he said, put it on display? This was supposed to be our, our vision of the 21st century deindustrialized high, high in, uh, yeah, service economy. And, and and what the sort of like high priest of neoliberalism can offer I as to why we should do this is why not? Why not? We're gonna hit a bottle of water. Yeah, in, right. in another speech, they should have had the Rockford Speedway. In, in there. another that would speech have been later on, he said, "Its content will contain a rich texture of feelings, spiritual, mm. emotional, fun, exhilarating like Disney World, yet different. Educational and interactive like the Science Museum, yet different. Emotional and uplifting like a West End musical, and yet different. So what is it?" Mm. That but not that. It's, it's the that but not that yeah. sketch. It's vibes. Yeah. It's purely vibes. It's, it's what we're going to do is because we're so great and we know we're so great because we are, uh, we're just going to collect all of our greatness here. But they, again, they made the mistake, unlike previous epochs where Britain decided to put on a, an exhibition to sort of show the world what it could do or remind them that it exists, it forgot to have anything to show. Yeah. 
Mm. They needed they needed to like go back to basics and like put some fucking tanks in there or something, you know, <laughs> slap, something to slap the side of and say that it's a fantastic bit of kit. You can't do that with a giant boy or you look like a nonce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the Tory Millennium Dome, I hate to say it, would have been a more interesting place to go because you would have had a tank in there. Mm. Yeah. So, well, there, there, there very conspicuously weren't tanks, but we'll get to that. So, um... Uh, uh, this guy, Stephen Bailey, who has this company called Imagination, he's like a big old ex Conran guy, uh, is drafted in by Mandelson, but then quits six months later because Mandelson is trying to interfere too much in these artistic decisions. Uh, and Bailey is sort of portrayed, and this is in a, a very good long read recently written by Imogen West Knights, um, is basically just lounging on the couch reading Proust for each meeting. So it's like the conflict between New Labour's uh, desire for mass appeal but also their obsession with hiring only highbrow, prestigious people to create something that these deeply cynical people will think has mass appeal. Is that, we've um, got any ideas for this dome, and the guy's like, have you tried smelling a cake? Watch for this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and that's the thing. What would go on to define the project of what to put in the dome is constant fighting between ministers who want to do, like, Aldi presents the shopping trolley of tomorrow, and then the people they actually hired to do it who were like, I would like to get, you know, um, the, the, young, the YBAs to paint a mural of like, you know, uh, something challenging and highbrow. Uh, so the, the other thing is in the papers at the time in the late 90s, you could not get away from the question of what the fuck is in the dome. Yeah. What's in the dome? What's in the dome? That's <laughs> What's what people in are the asking. Goddamn Remember the dome? movie Seven? What's in the dome? They were hyping up the dome, but they hadn't announced anything that was going to be in it because they didn't yeah, know. They had nothing. Yeah. Nobody knows, but it's provocative. So gets people going. <laughs> uh, so uh, everyone wanted to know what was in the dome. Uh, from the select com- this is from the select committee on, uh, on dome uh, to Mandelson. However inspirational the dome, the impact of the experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sometimes there's no substitute for you know a real loving relationship. However inspirational the dome, <laughs> the impact of the experience will depend principally upon what is inside the dome. Mm. That's very true of the that select very committee. True, yeah. <laughs> it was on this most important topics that we found official witnesses to this inquiry to be least informative. Mandelson then goes on in, in the sort of parliamentary records to say, uh, I assure the select committee it will be breathtaking, but I can say nothing further than this. This is just, again, a guy with, like, gummy bears in his briefcase. It's very great mm-hmm. to be spinning, like, I have no idea, as it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great. Um, and, and they went on to repeat this strategy with the Iraq war. <laughs> was oh, one the- there are. <laughs> Don't worry. There's stuff in there. <laughs> oh, boy, there is. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was, saying, you were it was one of the fir- It was one of the first mystery boxes. Yeah. It was a, it was a, it was loot, a loot crate. A yeah. loot box for the country. Uh, <laughs> a loot so, dome. In, in October of 98, uh, on the building site of the dome itself, this is just, again, I don't know how to describe this as profoundly British, but as soon as I tell you this, you will agree it is profoundly British. Mm. On October 1998, on the building site inside the dome itself, the BBC had a debate. This is also from Imogen West Knight's article, uh, by the way. Uh, the BBC held a televised debate about whether the dome was going to be good or bad. All the participants wore high-vis jackets and hard hats. Awesome. Yeah, uh, right. Cool. Art Love critic that. Brian Sewell jabbed his finger at the Dome's director of operations, Ken Robinson, and demanded repeatedly, tell us what's in it. Robinson declined to say anything. <laughs> uh, I'm pleading the fist on, on the Dome content. That will come up. <laughs> yeah, do not do do not mention what is in the Dome when the police ask you. Just ask for a solicitor mm. and say nothing else. I'm looking else. through some pictures right now, and I'm kind of like, if I was a normal person... I wouldn't be able to describe most things. So maybe it wasn't that they were keeping a surprise. Maybe it was because they literally just couldn't describe what was inside it. I can't how, say. It's just how, a giant boy. Trying to find the words for the giant boy. Yeah, how, yes. how do you tell people, like an ordinary person, there is a giant boy inside yeah. the dome? Well, he's not quite naked. <laughs> because the thing is, right, it's... <laughs> he's but on like, his launches. enough for it to be yeah, very there's, straight. There's, <laughs> it's, it's how do you describe something that is supposed to appeal to literally everybody, uplift and empower them, while at the same time angering no one. Yeah, there's, well, we have, we have a word for that now, and it's called Ed Sheeran. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, Again, that boy grew up to that be Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran. Could, yeah, exactly. Uh, so. <laughs> the little ginger boy in the dome. I now want to give you an example of how the hype actually worked, right? And this is uh, an excerpt from Peter Oborn's book, 
the rise of political lying. We are talking about a game called Surfball. Now, I'm sure oh, it's the sport yeah. of the 21st century, as I was assured by Peter Mandelson in um, the uh, uh, sort of parliamentary records that I've read. Um, and so I imagine everyone's been playing it in Britain. Like, you've all played Surfball, right? Yeah. Of course, mm-hmm. yeah. So, um, well, I'm asked in Parliament uh, about Surfball. He divulged a few details, but described it as an interactive attraction, which comes under the working title of Play at Surfball, the new 21st century sport. Uh, <laughs> the Times stated that Mr. Mandelson offered the committee a glimpse of the Dome's attractions. The most exciting entertainment would be an interactive computer game <laughs> called Surfball, which he described as the sport of the 21st century and a 15-minute roller coaster ride. Um, okay. Surfball yeah. hoof. Uh, the following That's week, right. Mandelson <laughs> once again said, the contents of the Millennium Experience will attract people of all ages, although I expect that playing surfball, the 21st century sport, will have an especial appeal to young people. And then... Why, do, why does it say surfball, the 21st century sport, mm. every time? Is it like a tribe called Quest, where you have mm. to say the, the whole thing? He then thing? wrote, a few days later, in the Evening Standard, don't panic, there's more than surfball. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, and then backbench labor he MPs said tugging at his collar. Backbench labor oh, MPs sure is. also started talking about surfball. Jim Fitzpatrick, uh, the MP for Poplar and Canning Town, my old MP, uh, declared that the sport would bring regeneration to his consi- constituency. What? Uh, I would. Uh, what? <laughs> I wouldn't contemplate surfing a ball myself. He declared. I just want to see 1.6 million surfballers arriving. Uh, what what the okay? Allow me to just yeah. just just hear me out for a second here. What the fuck is surfball? <laughs> What's the sport of the twenty first century? That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, and, and it would create so many jobs for surfball manufacturers, yeah. surfball which, coaches, which dec- surfball yeah. physios. I have to admit, I thought you. I didn't realize you were making a joke. I thought this was just some arcane British sport that you have to play in school. Oh, that you all I've knew what it was. I've never heard before in my life. No, ever. Well, that is actually like a relief to me because I was like, God, this country's even fucking weirder just, than no, I thought. I, I mean, it would have been funny to gaslight you for the rest of the hour, but no. <laughs> oh, no I, you've never uh, played uh, surfball? <laughs> yeah, this guy's never played surfball. I, I actually represented my county in surfball. Yeah, yeah so. that's like, it's actually surf with an E. <laughs> so it was, it was, so uh, the city of Durham MP Jerry Steinberg stated the sport was quite exciting. In it's fact, a, what's the deal? I don't deny <laughs> that it's very exciting. My secretary will definitely play surfball. <laughs> I like the idea of Jerry Steinberg being an off-brand Jerry Seinfeld oh, okay. that we've got. <laughs> uh, uh, Watford MP Claire Ward, uh, who was on the Commons Culture, Media, and Sports Select Committee, uh, conjured up the image of surfballers wearing some kind of virtual millennium headgear that you put on with gloves that are connected up to a bodysuit. Oh, so when you move, you feel as if you're part of the balls running in your headset. So what? Wait, so you're part of the wh- well, look because uh, you're a ball balls in your head. It's surfball. Yeah. Oh, uh, it did, but it's a sport, okay, not a video game. But it is played in an immersive computer simulation that's indistinguishable from reality. Oh, it's Tron. Um. So. <laughs> no, it's Ender's game. You're actually piloting a drone over Iraq. <laughs> so, um, and it was revealed, indeed, a computer scientist at Yale called Kentaro Toyama, and I, I looked at this in the archives, had indeed created a device called a surfball that was essentially a motion tracking device for gaming. When asked about this by The Independent, he says, I've never heard of Peter Mandelson or the Millennium Experience. Who are you and what are you talking about? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> there was never surfball. It was nothing. It was just Peter. It was just basically they said, "Well, they're asking for some specifics, so I'm gonna just sort of invent the 21st century sport mm-hmm. on the fly, and then say basically it's gonna be what becomes the metaverse." Did this man then end up falling down a, dis- a distinctly non-vegan staircase? So, so, <laughs> and, and and this is this is just like the the I think the best example of just like every everyone kind of coming to an agreement that well, technology is quite wonderful, and I assume that we'll all be sort of basically living in the computer soon anyway. So even if we haven't invented the future yet, we know what future we are inventing and we assume it'll be ready in time for the millennium. Of so course. we're just all going to go four square in behind surfball. Um, so hmm. this is now Jenny Page. This is back from Hansard being questioned in 99. Uh, Page says, the zone, the play zone is going to be very interesting. Frankly, I think it will. It has come a very, very long way since we last debated it. Where it knows now we'll have quite a number of interactive games. They're not the sort of games that you think they will be. They really are not. We have very clear editorial control, and what we're proposing in that zone is taking forward electronic play into the areas which nobody has seen in operation before, and it will be radically different from an arcade. It will not be like an arcade at all. Robert Ayling, MP, asks, So the surfball is now dead and buried? 
Jenny Page responds, I plead the fifth on surfball. I will keep you guessing on surfball <laughs> until we open. <laughs> Robert Ailing presses the question. So the surfball is still in existence. Uh, Ms. Page responds, I plead the Fifth Amendment. It, wait, so she it, she's working for the British government, but she doesn't understand what the Fifth Amendment is. I, I think she's. I think it's, it's more of a colloquialism of saying, I'm not going to answer your question. <laughs> I will not talk about the surfball, but I promise it will be no. incredible. Under any I demand a lawyer. Yeah. It's just, it's basically, <laughs> it's, you know what it is? It's the Metaverse version one. Of just a, a bunch of charlatans making a grandiose claim about a totally immersive computer simulation in order to just, like, keep their plate spinning for another day. I would have liked it if Jenny Page had said, can we please get the mockery out of the way? I was, I, I was going to say, I just remembered that at the Dome, there was actually a plate spinning exhibition. There was! Fuck! Yes! Was. I remember this! <laughs> there was a plate spinning exhibition. Oh. I, just, I, think it was weird. <laughs> I think it was weird of them to get Johannes Vonk and the Clogheads to do... A, a surfball song for the millennium. But. There was actually an yeah, but, exhibit yeah. of Dutch child pornography. That is to say, pornography for children, <laughs> not pornography featuring children, which is disgusting. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a music video. There's a music video hidden somewhere in like the National Archives where Tony Blair plays the guitar on a Johannes Vonk and the Clogheads song. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so uh, in '98, uh, Mandelson has the first of two um, sort of impropriety related. Uh, political scandals that sort of damage his career. The second one... That's such, that's such a cop phrasing, an impropriety-related scandal. Yeah. Uh, so, this is In the a Mandelson-involved twink. So, this involves <laughs> yeah. him basically having an undeclared loan from a major donor. The second of this... And so he's fired as Minister for Dome. Well, I, I, I noticed the gentleman had applied lubrication to the staircase. Uh, and then the second scandal, of course, <laughs> being getting the free flat from Ellie Khalil, who was implicated in the Equatorial Guinea coup. Wasn't the free flat with Ellie Khalil also the place where he was photographed staring at uh, one Jeffrey Epstein across <laughs> a very large vase? Uh, I always thought they were going belt shopping. Um, he is holding a white belt in that photo, so it did seem, <laughs> unless, unless belts are just strung <laughs> around the house with the buttery <laughs> staircase, it did look like they were actually shopping. Basically, so we're at this point, right, where... Um, where Mandelson is sort of on his way out. He's not out yet. Um, where Falconer is on his way in. He's not in yet. Um, we've decided that um, about one-fifth of the total amount of money that we're going to spend in the Millennium Dome is going to come from sponsors. The rest is going to be lottery money. Um, and uh, we, we sort of have our plan to have 12 million people, the most successful exhibit of its kind in like the continental region. Um, are going is, is that is, simple as yeah absolutely that's what's needed to make this thing a success so um <laughs> this is again during a debate on the dome in 1998 when mandelson's still in charge debate the dome he says construction is on time and if anything it's ahead of time spending is within budget costs are firmly under control and creative development of the dome's contents has leaped ahead Arrangements for the national program are well in hand. The Millennium Company is performing highly competently. It's doing a job of utmost importance to the country and deserves our support. That's a classic Mandelson yeah. lie, to be like, construction is on time, and then becoming emboldened a little bit by hearing yourself <laughs> say it. If anything, it's ahead of time. Yeah. Not only is there surf ball, there are other kinds of ball, which I won't go into. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, we have created a new dimension of computer simulation in the dome. <laughs> That's right, there's, there's stuff being presented in 5D. <laughs> So, uh, this is, uh, this is again, back to Imogen West Knight's retrospective on the Dome. She, said, she quotes uh, an exhibition designer, Peter Higgins, uh, New Labour really did think it was going to be some sort of quasi-political sociological experience that would underpin everything they were about. Uh, however, under Mandelson... And he, in a way, it did. <laughs> well, that's just the thing. It did. Yeah. yeah. It's just not in the way that they sort of expected, not in the way that they foresaw. They really are Greek tragic figures. They're just fulfilling the prophecy, but not in any of the ways they expect. <laughs> mm. um, and, and, and Higgins says, right, that uh, the brief was very thin. They weren't given any kind of budget at all. And instead, we're just given some open-ended questions like, are you what you eat? Will designer people be around later? Uh, and for designer people. And Blair said... That he is, he was all, all he was interested in was content that had what he called, quote, the Ewan factor, which is cool enough that his 13 year old son would want to see it. Oh, so, yeah. That's, that's what makes shit cool. Yeah. I thought it was going to be at least mm. like a good Ewan, like Ewan McGregor or something. He was pretty cool at the time. Nope. It's a lame no. Ewan. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> you and Blair, who went on to become a startup guy, the least cool kind of guy you can be. And so mm. the, this was the main clash, right? In the, in the furnishing of this thing mm. that was supposed to propel Britain into the future, that was going to be the thesis statement of what the future was going to be, uh, was political advisors uh, who, cla- who, are, who basically yeah, wanted, like, Aldi presents the shopping cart of the future, and then the zone designers who were, ex- who were basically very um, snobbish and highbrow. Turtle yeah, exactly. guys. Yeah. Uh, and so they this is... Loosh. They wanted, like, Marinetti presents the shopping cart of the future. <laughs> 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 so this, this is uh, further from Knight's article. Uh, With more than 30,000 visitors expected every day in 2000, the dome would need extensive catering. There would be two enormous branches of McDonald's, as well as a Yo Sushi and a cafe called Simply Internet. Yo Sushi was the most futuristic shit you could imagine in the year 2000. Yeah. In that respect, they're like, yo, it has a conveyor belt. That's why it was called Yo Sushi, because you went in there and you went, yo. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Simply Internet, I have mm. to say. Um, and so this is, this, this is Bailey we're talking about, the, um, the, the, the designer. Mm. Uh, says he ruse he ruse the catering he proposed yeah, a I love f- to rue he, he, propo- he, he proposed it? a farmer's market you could have had oh, sourdough bread sake. and goat's cheese instead the public had to eat filth from mcdonald's filth yeah filth i didn't know mcdonald's served filth but there you go yeah, so well. it is it's just the that everybody every single person involved in the dome does have a different kind of contempt for everyone that lives in britain it's just do you think that they need to be uplifted by exposure to your middle class tastes or do you think that they're a bunch of like, you know, um, um, ignorant slop hogs who need to be just jammed through sort of um, uh, whatever fast food company will give you, you know, 20 pounds? It's both of these, mm. both of these positions to pl- dis- it should uh, be like, like a, a fundamental hogwash. contempt for the anyone who is going to come and, and actually go through this dome. The people of Britain must be funneled through a series of narrow canals <laughs> where they'll be sp- jet washed <laughs> by, the, by the stewards of the millennium. <laughs> right? So, um, basically, this is... So then, uh, sort of in... Mandelson is sacked. Uh, Charlie Falconer comes in. Um, and uh, Falconer, that interviewed in The Guardian at the time, says, I'm confident it won't go wrong. Quite the reverse. <laughs> the dome has hmm. been a triumph. I, I'm confident Classic it will go Labor well. Classic lying is you say the you say the untruth and then you double down on it in the second sentence. If anything, it's going to go fantastic. <laughs> the dome has been a triumph for mainly British contractors and designers. It has regenerated a poisoned site, and it will create jobs and will be enormous fun. The underground links will, will it all certainly be- did create jobs. I mean, there are a lot of people who I feel like should never have had a job who got a job making this. <laughs> <laughs> um, the underground links will all be built and operating. Um, we are. We will be glad we did it. Believe me. Write that down. We will be glad we did it. Hey, Lenny, you're writing this down because you should. <laughs> it's worth. It's worth jotting down. Uh, he's also adamant that all the zones will be ready. As to what's in them, he believes it will be very interesting, but declines to say more. We have done it to show what the UK can do. Yeah. Fucking nothing. <laughs> Can build a yeah, build a big tent with a giant child inside. Built, yeah. We built a big boy. <laughs> <laughs> we built a big lad. Uh, we, there's a there's a, mm-hmm. there's a McDonald's, a Yo Sushi, build a weird mouth. Yep. Yeah, we're a nation of weird treat boys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we built some spinning yeah. plates. Mm-hmm. Uh, Absolutely. We, and an circus, exhibition called the British Salacia. Economy. <laughs> uh, he is now responsible for finding a use for the dome after the millennium year. There are some interesting suggestions in tenders, it is clear, but he pr- remains coy as to who is suggesting what to do. And again, yeah. Ooh, mm. mystery. Mm. Mystery governments. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, the, this is... Such a fucking unboxing-ass way of framing public policy. It's that they were... This, this does sort of, I think, betray one um, new labor obsession that comes out later on, which is the real hostility towards any public scrutiny of anything they're doing because they will believe it will somehow be ruined by people knowing about it. Like, they were insanely hostile to freedom of information requests, for example, like, as we spoke about in our episodes about the Home Office and stuff, right? And these were new labor reforms. It's just here, what they're doing is they're doing this, um, they're, they're, they're doing it for, in service of something fundamentally goofy, but they're doing it, they're, they're nevertheless betraying this, like, even before 2001, this very inner authoritarian tendency of theirs. Mm. I'm mm. very confident that not only are there weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, but also that there is a surf ball. 
<laughs> <laughs> well, like what's really what's really grim, right, is that like this kind of authoritarianism, as you say, appears to derive entirely from like an urge to showmanship. <laughs> well, in this case, it certainly does. I think in general, it tends to derive from this idea of their own inherent greatness in that other people mm. will not understand how great it is what they're doing and will try to get in the way of their, you know, utopian vision, but they're liberal utopian yeah, like vision. Saddam yeah, exactly. Is. Or uh, the Labour Party's actual members yeah. and people in Britain who vote. I, I, I do find it's very funny how this is relevant again, both because it's weird, but also because... Peter Mandelson has been restored to a position of profound authority within the Labour Party. And looking at this stuff, you were just reminded how much utter contempt they have for people who aren't with them or who aren't, you know, in their club. But also, I think more than anything else, how fucking weird and out of touch they all are. For all of the accusations of, you know, uh, of the previous four and a half years of the Labour Party that we won't talk about, like of them being out of touch with the average person, I cannot under any circumstances believe that like oh yeah if you put this weird shit like peter mandelson jeffrey epstein's friend who uh and, and the house with buttery stairs versus jeremy corbyn rides a bike and is a vegetarian which of those sounds weirder like which of those is less relatable <laughs> and i don't want to like i don't want to like shoehorn you know jeremy corbyn uh as le labor leader into the discussion too much here but i'm just like these people are so fucking weird like i thought mike skinner from the streets was being just like off his head on drugs when he just went on that weird rant about peter mandelson but i think he was right <laughs> i think peter mandelson did somehow go hear, hear strange voices and got his brain fried on something fucking strange and they had to like send him away to be reprogrammed genuinely like well it's, it's good i was gonna say right it's this it, it this you can't imagine sort of just how fucking weird you have to be to a invent just a lie about like okay i'm going to invent what's going to become the metaverse it's called surfball and then for everybody mm -hmm. in your like little friend club to just fall in and perfectly pick up the lie until it's just found out as soon as someone asks an obvious question hey you seem to have invented something similar called the same thing is this what that is and then he says no i don't know these people like how fucking weird do you have to be to do that? It, 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 it's it's the weirdness of these people and the fact that like, correct me if I'm wrong, but was the Millennium Dome received with any kind of like criticism or sort of lukewarm response? Did was it actually enthusiastically received? Because it just th there's this there's this problem that I have when I look at any of this period of british politics which is that you always assume because it's so fucking weird and, and just like wrong-headed that surely once it makes contact with reality with normal people then it's you know revealed to be the farce that it is and yet that never seems to happen in this country oh no we we love clown shit in this country like i like at the time i would i mean i was a child but like people were into it like partly yeah, because yeah, there I was no so. you had no idea what it actually was you were just being told it was going to be awesome the no certainly the london <laughs> the london eye was much more the kind of like uh the legacy of it i think like in the sense that like the london eye became a like legend slash hen party night out in london fixture come down from kettering for mm. a big one you know mm. It, well, the thing is, right, you ask, was it well received? Well, who by? And this is where these, this thing gets a very confused legacy, because a lot of journalists and editors hated it because many of them were invited to this opening party, but then at the Millennium Dome, but then not treated like the important special boys they all thought they were. And so they kind of declared a vendetta on the Dome. Um, and a lot of the people who did like the Dome were sort of children who were just like, it's kind of a day out and they're easy to impress. Um, yeah, but one, it's they didn't sell nearly as many tickets as they thought they would. They sold only six of the projected twelve million. That's still quite a bit. They sold six, yeah, six, six tickets. tickets. Um, and the whole thing was sort of, it seems in popular in sort of official memory, it's remembered as a flop. But you know, it's but it's. It's 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 dif it's difficult to parse. So in fact, the opening well, any, anything anything would be remembered as a flop if they you know if you hype it up to the extent that this had been hyped up because that's the abiding memory that I have of the dome is how much the the government and like and this filtered all the way down to like your teacher even just were not allowed to shut the fuck up about the dome right or the or the millennium right it was like 
it was hyped up to the extent that anything would have been a disappointment. Um, and so the opening night itself, again, was because it's Britain, plagued by huge infrastructural problems. Uh, so the Queen, the PM, worthies and grandees, lords and ladies, uh, celebrities and so on, all went to the Dome. Uh, but a bunch of guests just weren't sent their tickets and so had to go to uh, Stratford Tube Station to then get on the Jubilee line to come down. And they queued for like hours because the security scanners that were um, set up to make sure like, you know, metal detectors and stuff um, were incorrectly in like they were installed backwards and so didn't work. Um, and so and everyone in their like uh, black tie was issued uh, a plot like um, like an airline meal and a quarter size bottle of discount champagne. When they got in. They were treated to a concert featuring Stephen Fry, The Coors, Jules Holland, and Mick Hucknall. Um, <laughs> oh, we, we celebrated it with a fucking hootenanny, of course uh, we did. I'm just imagining The Coors just changing the, the lyrics to their hit song, Breathless, just instead of, you know, whatever the lyrics were, it just becomes, do wo do wo <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you didn't laugh at that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just still. I, I get angry every time anyone mentions Jules Holland to me. Our most inexplicable fixture of of the national fucking topography. This guy who like uh, uh, sees your hit song and goes, "Is it okay if I come down and play like two notes on a piano to make it boogie woogie?" And we as a nation all <laughs> just say, "Yes, that's fine." Actually. <laughs> It's very funny because Jules Holland was in Squeeze. Like he was a normal musician, like guy in a band once. He was just mm. the keyboardist for Squeeze. But now he's he just become Mr. New Year. Yeah, now he's just the guy who's on TV all the time and has been. I mean, I remember bands that I was into in the early 2000s when I was still in high school, you know, would perform on Jules Holland whatever the show was called and you'd yeah, find those clips nanny. on like fucking yeah, you'd find those <laughs> clips on like WinMX or whatever, you know, of, of bands performing. And it's just crazy that, you know, people were talking about, yeah, just, just New Year's 2022. Jules Holland, still yep. there, still just fucking doing it's his Britain, thing. Britain, baby. Yeah, but it's because no, Britain, yep. Britain never Nothing really change. changes. Uh, it just sort of, it, it slowly gets worse. Yeah. Um, so. do um, do um, <laughs> that boy is naked. So, <laughs> I just find it very cute that like, even like decades, decades before like the current situation of columnists, like their kind of grievances are still exactly the same. And it's like, they'll kind of hold you accountable and call you out on your shit, but only if they like feel they've been mistreated. Mm. I mean, the, the, the dome would have had a much more hostile reception had Twitter been extant is the thing. Like, all you need is a photo of someone's airline style plastic meal. And it would have gone over like fire fest. Uh, so the, Page, Jenny Page is fired uh, almost immediately, and, and then Gerbeau takes over. Um, with <laughs> yeah, we who will rescue this troubled project? How about the king of French ice hockey? That's right. To be fair, also he was an executive at Euro Disney, which did sort of turn around. J'aime yeah. faire du hockey du glace. So, has a lot of crossover actually with um, with the, the surfball. So uh, m the Millennium. <laughs> this is this goes from from an ad that was running towards the. Um, once they realized this was not a very good dome. The Millennium Experience at the Dome is going to close forever. Maybe you'll love it, maybe you won't. Why not come and decide for yourself while you still can? <laughs> maybe, still yeah, can. Give it, in the Keir Starmer voice, maybe give it a go. Maybe, yeah, give it give a, go. a go. It's a yogurt. <laughs> yeah. So, look, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the first episode there. The second episode, we're going to go into the dome, go ex 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 exhibit <laughs> by exhibit, we're going to look at two men enter, one man Yeah, leaves. we're going to be getting dome. We're going to be looking at mm -hmm. exhibit by exhibit. We're going to be looking at the legacy of the dome, the aftermath, uh, more careers being damaged by elements of it. Uh, and we'll see you on the bonus episode. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Go.